Coming to our next talk. So, um, your topic is making games with uh, JavaScript and Phaser I.O. And um, you said that you built <laughs> a lot of games already, yeah. but your first browser game was a wedding invitation game. That's true. For, uh, for the audience of your wedding. It's yeah. very, very cool. That was fun, and it had a lot of interesting logistical problems. Like, we sent out nicely. We actually printed our own like uh, DVD covers and burned the it was weird. We used an Electron app to bring a browser game to a physical medium, um, which is a great idea. And it works perfectly fine. However, we had this logistical problem that all our nerd friends have new hardware, which means no CD-ROM drives anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a web version, so check. All right, so we take that box. And how to make games with JavaScript you're now going to present. So exactly. enjoy Martin Split. Thank you very much. Ah, isn't that lovely, all these wonderful people? Grüezi wohl, as we would say in Swiss German. Uh, and the Swiss people go, what? Because I have a terrible German accent as well. Um, anyway, so yeah, nice meeting you, everybody. I hope that you had a big you know, round of fun this morning. So can I get a whoop whoop if it was nice? Like, you know, give a round of applause to the organizers. <laughs> Woo, awesome. Sweet. I know, you know, this is the block after lunch and everyone's like, oh, I'm going to sit in these comfy chairs in half dim lit room and I'm just going to sleep, which is fine, but you're going to get some eye candy and you're going to miss out on that when you have a nap now. Anyway, so I would like to talk about making games. But first things first, I think we should figure out what is happening when, or what do you need to get running? What is the moving targets that you have to get in control of when you're making a game? So. Um, when I started making games, I didn't make them for the web. I made them for the PlayStation. No, actually, no. I started with the Commodore 64. Um, now people are starting to Yeah, woo, yeah, Commodore, fuck yeah. Um, and that's a technical term, all right? If, if a compilation run works, then you go like, fuck yeah. And that's a technical term. That's not swear words. Um, and uh, Commodore 64, and then later the PC, which I found kind of boring, so I moved on to the uh, I tried it with a Game Boy, but it was really hard to get to the cartridges, so I skipped that one. And then the PlayStation Portable in 2005, I think, came around, and I built games for that, which was ridiculous amounts of effort because you had to like, put them on the memory stick, and you basically had to hook it up with your you know, like, USB cable, and you would compile it on your computer. Then you would have a, a, a linked executable that you would then drop into the file system of the pro, uh, PlayStation Portable, open it with a particular tool. Then the, the PlayStation Portable crashed. Then you could select the file that you want to run from, and then you actually had your game. So fixing bugs was fun, right? It's like, OK, I'm going to, oh, it crashed because I left out, I don't know, something. And uh, oh, OK, and then, then let's try again in 15 minutes. Um, yay. Uh, same then for the Nintendo Wii, so it was pretty much the same, same deal. You have to like transfer things and then... Uh, uh, uh. And someone finally bought, uh, built a tool called PSP Link that allowed you to like link from straight from your computer and uh, it, then this tool crashes and you're like, ah, oh, what? Um, so yeah, but what really fascinated me for making games was the fact that it encompassed so many different aspects, right? So if you build a website, you're probably, if, if you're having a static website at least, uh, which was what was cool the days when I started doing things in the web, um, you basically just had your FTP program and a bunch of files and you just you know, uploaded them and then that was it. And you were concerned with things like, how does it look in different browsers? Will the tables render correctly in Netscape? Um, <laughs> that was a thing, yeah. CSS, this stuff for kids, you know. You, you have it nice. Anyway, um, so yeah, you were concerned with like, how does it render in different browsers? How does it render in different resolutions? To which we had a really easy solution. It would, you had have like a footer saying, this is best viewed in Netscape Navigator on a Windows computer with a 1024 by 768 screen resolution. And then when people complained, you were like, well, you can read there that, you know, it's not my fault, it's yours. Which is not how the web works, just saying. If you do this again, I'm going to track you down and I'm going to complain. And I'm German, so I'm really good at complaining. Um, anyway, so in a game, you have to deal with like, how things look as well. 
Normally, when you do it on a PlayStation Portable, you can make a lot of assumptions, right? Because you know that you have certain buttons on certain positions, you have certain hardware, you have a certain processor speed, you have a certain speed of uh, uh, how the display works, like the refresh rate, the resolution is the same all the time. So you can make a lot of assumptions, so that's really nice. When you do web games, well, 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 responsive and stuff, and you can't really make assumptions like that on, on the web surface. So that is really interesting because it's challenging, right? You can't just go like, and then you use your gamepad, and then like 95% of the people who actually run your game will go like, my what? I'm on the phone. <laughs> so yeah, you have to deal with this kind of stuff, right? Um, you also have to deal with how you actually make it look and make it feel, because that conveys a lot of the story. You need to figure out your storytelling as well. Right? What story are you going to tell? What kind of settings are the people in that are going to play this? Is this a flappy bird that I can just pick up and play quickly? Or is it, a, um, is it rather a pff, Fallout kind of game where you have to create a character and then you know, just have a longer running story? Or you have World of Warcraft which makes everyone unemployed and takes away all your friends? Um, and replaces them with virtual friends which is probably as good, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't trade my friends for that, but you know, your choice. Um, and then you have to figure out, so with the capabilities that I can expect, so the buttons and the screen size and all that and the setting that the person is in, how does my game actually work? Because for a website, browsers do all these nasty things for us that we don't have to worry about. A button, unless I screw up, and please do not, like if you, if you start with a diff and go like, this is a button, then no. There is a thing called a button element and you can use that to have a button, but buttons behave like buttons. So you click on them or you just, you know, use your keyboard to tap to them and then use uh, space or, or return, and they trigger. So these, all these interaction patterns are defined. You have best practices, you have uh, uh, guidelines that you can follow and you should follow. Please do follow them. However, in game design, normally you start from scratch. You start from a black screen and then you go from there. So that's a lot more work. And uh, if you ever have built a menu system that works with different types of inputs on a, uh, on a game system like the, the, the Nintendo uh, Wii or something, then you know that it's not a great fun. So when you go to the DOM, you're not like, uh, the form carrying. Uh, no, you're really happy that you have them. But in games, you have to rethink them. And then your game mechanics have to like, depend on that as well. If, if the game is really fast paced, that's probably not gonna work that well on a mobile screen. Or if you need like very precise, if you have like, I don't know, a sniping game or something like Fruit Ninja, then that works great on, Fruit Ninja works great on a, on a touch screen because you just slice fruit in, uh, in just a swipey manner. But doing that with a controller, with a gamepad, is a bit awkward, isn't it? Or even worse with the keyboard, it's like, what, okay, what? Um, so you really have to think this kind of stuff through. And then comes physics as well. So you really need to figure, figure out, it's a virtual world, so no, none of the real world constraints exist. There's no such thing as gravity, so you have to build it yourself which is very bootstrappy, really, because you go back to like, okay, I'm gonna, it's like one of these things, like if you wanna build something, something, then you have to invent the universe first, and that's kinda, that's what game development is. So it encompasses all of these different topics, and they are wildly different topics. So with figuring out why I wanna build a game and what goes into building a game, like all this kind of stuff that I have to take care of, why did I choose JavaScript? I, there's so many options, right? There's Unity, there's Unreal Engine, there's, uh, Play Canvas, and there's a, there's a ton of things that, that do this. There's Game Maker from the olden days if you want to build really boring games. Um, but why did I choose JavaScript? Well, JavaScript has a bunch of advantages that we hopefully are aware of. And the biggest important, the most important one thing was that it is really, really easy to very quickly iterate on things. Because I could literally load it in the browser and go like, okay, the gravity value I'm not sure about, so I'm going to try it out. Okay, no, it's, it's wrong, it's not good, it's not fun to work with this. So um, I just open the dev tools and then I go, okay, gravity is now something else, and then you try it again. So you no know, recompilation, no you know, copying files <laughs> over to a device and then running it again 10 minutes later. No, you can literally just go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna press this button, I don't like the outcome, typey, 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 I like it less than I did before, typey, 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 this feels right. So it's a really, really 
quick feedback loop and you can iterate really, really quickly. And with these, all these moving targets like game mechanics, uh, menu system, uh, input system, all this kind of stuff, it's really, really important to get to your idea quickly that you can also iterate really, really quickly on uh, implementations, which is wonderful. The other thing with the games that I built beforehand was that um, not everyone has the same type of console, right? A lot of friends then went to Xbox uh, and PlayStation because of this one game they really wanted to play that I couldn't be bothered to actually be interested in. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, I have this awesome game for the Nintendo Wii. And then five people online said, hey, that's interesting. Ah. Whereas when you do JavaScript, you basically have the web. So you have probably everyone in the audience here has some sort of device that is capable of playing the game that I just built which is amazing and it, it's much, much more fun because you want to interact with people, you want to see what they get out of it and if they have fun because it, you probably want to build something that people have fun with. And if this is only limited to a group of nine people in the world, yeah, right? The motivation uh, yeah, is a bit tricky, isn't it? Uh, but if you know that everyone can play it, there was, that was the reason why I did it for the, uh, for the wedding invitations. Like, I know that some people are a little on the offline side. Hey, ger rural German areas uh, where having fiber is actually a bad thing. Um, so they were kind of like, oh, yeah, we only have really slow internet, so eh, we don't really go, uh, like, use our computer that much. We mostly use our phones for fast internet connections. So I'm like, okay, so I would have to build an, uh, an, an Android app. But then there's, like, a part of my family is on iOS. <sighs> uh, hmm. So, yeah, that's not really nice and really feasible. So the web was the, the, the right choice for this one. And it worked really well. I mean, everyone we invited showed up to our wedding, so I guess that worked really well. Um, and also, so JavaScript allows you to think on uh, slightly higher level concepts, right? So whereas if you build something in C or C++, you oftentimes go like, oh, shit, no, I have a null pointer reference here. That's why it crashes in level five when I enter this particular room after I enter this other room because then the pointers flip and then everything goes to shit, um, which is also a technical phrase. Uh, and, uh, and JavaScript doesn't do this to you. It's just like, okay, I have this array here and I have this variable here that points to something in the array and we are mostly safe. So that's actually quite nice and allows you to do fun things. Last but not least, and that's also an, an important point for, for PhaserJS, uh, is it has a great community. So you have a lot of resources, you have a lot of people that help you out there. You have like JS Game Dev or HTML5 Game Dev mailing lists and Slack channels and all that. So there's a lot of people helping you if you get stuck. And then you can build things like this. So this, uh, you may see that the, the spaceship is glowing, and you can only destroy the asteroids in the color that you are right now glowing in. And you can uh, cycle between the different colors, and then you can, if you're not as bad as I am, you can basically shoot the asteroids that come around. And building this game took, what, an, a day maximum, and only because I had like half a day walking around town or something. So that's, that's not too bad. You can actually build nice looking, interesting games uh, really quickly. That was not my wedding invitation, just saying. <laughs> um, and that brings us to the game loop. So if you look at what, what does this game do, right? So basically, we're we are moving around. So I press buttons or move things on my uh, touch screen, and then this thing starts moving. So I kind of have to you know, take inputs and move things around. And then also, these, these asteroids have different speeds and directions that they fly in, and I have to move these around as well. And then I have to check if I'm, if I'm firing bullets. If I'm not out of bullets, a new bullet is created, and the bullets move themselves as well. And if they hit an asteroid, there's this little animation playing, this little explosion playing. And then the score is updated, and then the text updates. And this keeps happening over and over again, because it's basically the same thing. It's like we check if we are moving. We check if, the, if there's bullets. If there's bullets, we move them as well. We always move the asteroids around. And then we check if the, astero uh, if the bullets and the asteroids collide, or if my ship and an asteroid collides. And then we change variables accordingly. Uh, and then we display the value of these two variables, the lives and the score, which is this wonderful game loop. So at some point, we start setting things up, right? We load the files that we need. Uh, we set up the variables, probably like, I don't know, five lives and zero, uh, score of zero. Uh, and then we are in the setup stage. Once we have everything set up, we maybe display a menu and wait for the player to say, yes, I want to start the game right now. 
And then you get, you get into this actual game loop because then the game actually starts happening. And what happens there is we draw things on the screen. We could also switch the order a bit, but it doesn't matter that much. We draw things on screen so that the user sees something. The user sees, oh, I'm here, and here's an asteroid, or I don't know, I'm, I'm here, and here's a power up. So I want to move. So they press things, right? They press a button, or they tap on the screen, or they press a button on their, on their uh, game controller, or something like that. Or they shout a certain word to their computer, or whatever. There's all sorts of weird input APIs, so whew. Um, so basically, we then read this input, whatever that takes. And um, if the input does not break out, because I pressed escape and I want to exit the game, then we're going to go forward, because based on the inputs, we now update our world. Which means if I pressed jump, then my player now needs to start jumping. If something is bound to be moving, now I'm actually moving it a tiny little bit. And then I draw the world, because the, here's my asteroid, something happens, I move the asteroid, I draw the asteroid on screen so you can see it moving, and then I keep going like that. At some point, either because the world update or the input says so, we end this game. What does that mean? Well, as I said, if I press escape, sure, I probably want to tear down and say, like, game over, and then maybe, like, reset the everything to, to the beginning state. Um, but also, what happens if my, my ship hits in one of the asteroids and that was my last life? Well, then I also want to display game over and probably, like, let the user enter something for their username, for the high score list, and stuff like that. And that's the game loop. That's the primary construct that no matter what technology you're going to be using, you're going to have something more or less like this. Obviously, the details may vary a bit, but that's the high-level concept of how a game works. So as I said, in the setup stage, we load the assets, so we get all the graphics downloaded and everything set up. Uh, we show, like, hey, press space to start or something, and then we basically set up the level as well, and we reset the values so that the score is zero and all that kind of stuff. And um, once we have passed that, then we get to draw the world. And how do you do that in the web? Well, you use the canvas, because it's kind of like the thing that gives you pixel access. Who here has worked with a canvas before? All right, that's, oh, that's pretty good. Whew. Kudos. Um, I have been to audiences where everyone's like, can what? Um, which is fine, you know, can I use canvas? Um, yes, you can. Um, most of the times, most of the game frameworks these days now default to WebGL, which is also the canvas, but it's the 3D API for the canvas. Why that? Even if you're doing 2D games, it is most often, uh, like very often it is much, much faster than Canvas 2D because it is using the GPU much more. I can go on to a 40-minute talk on that one. If you're interested, then just, you know, grab me. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about it if you want to get bored or if you have trouble sleeping. Um, it's absolutely not a problem. But yeah, WebGL most of the times is faster, so if you want to build it yourself from scratch, definitely have a look at uh, WebGL frameworks such as 3JS or Babylon, even if you do a 2D game because it's just much, much faster to move a lot of things at the same time in uh, WebGL versus Canvas 2D. So what we then do is we basically render things in the chrono more or less chronological order from the back to the, to the front. It's not chronological. It's a, from basically from far away to closer because things are being drawn over each other. So we start with a background, then we start with level objects, then we draw the player, and then maybe things that like, I don't know, um, bullets and stuff like that, particles of sorts. Um, yeah, so we draw things more or less in a, in a certain order, and um, then we do this again and again and again, and that's how things are moving. For reading input, you have different possibilities. Um, you can use the, the keyboard, which uh, usually uh, emits events, so you have an event-based system. Um, you could also use uh, devices, for instance, if you use the Kinect, you probably have to pause, so basically you have to ask it where are things, uh, which is slightly different. Um, you can also use the GamePad API, which is also mostly event-driven, uh, which is great as well, uh, but obviously you can't rely on a GamePad being around. And gamepads are a bit tricky because it's, it's really weird how they map things. Like different controllers map different buttons differently. So for some, the A button on, on, the, on the controller is the first button. For some, it's like one of the triggers, and they're like, what? So if you have like to shoot with the, what the, what am I doing here? So it's a bit tricky. The gamepad API is improving and stabilizing, so that's great. Uh, you sh if you have never used the game, who here has used the gamepad API? Ooh, surprise. The gamepad API is fun. You should all try it. Get a cheap one, it's fine. Um, in update world, what we do is we basically calculate 
the new state. If we are in React, basically this is where you get the new state for your world, right? So you have some sort of world state where everything is, how much everything like, what's the life uh, counter of this one, what's the score here, and then you basically recalculate things for the next display on screen. You also have like timers, maybe a bullet only lives for 10 seconds or something, and then you just, you know, remove it afterwards, and all kinds of that stuff. And here is where game mechanics happen. This is where game mechanics happen. So this is where you check, can the player jump right now? Can the player uh, um, go there? Because, uh, okay, the player pressed go up, but there's a wall, so no going up here. We just, you know, let the player be where it was before. And, uh, oh, now we can actually move upwards, so we're gonna, you know, move the player here. Uh, moving the player basically just means like the position on screen changes, so you just change a variable, so it's not like magic or something. Um, and obviously also if like, if a bullet hits my ship, um, uh, an asteroid hits my ship and uh, that's my last life, then the game ends. So this is also where the game can actually branch out of that loop and go into the end state. And then we have the cleanup where we reset everything, allow the player to play another game, do like high scores and all that kind of stuff and also exit the game finally. So that's more or less what each of these stages really do. And um, as I said, this kind of is the same for every game. So if you start from scratch with vanilla JS, you have to basically do a lot of things that you have to do for every game. So it makes sense to abstract these away. And that's the reason why game engines exist. Because you have to do the same things for pretty much every game. You have collision detection, figuring out if something collides with something else, if a player collides with a wall, if a player collides with another enemy. Uh, that kind of stuff with an item. Um, you have to have like physics, things that are moving, things that are falling down automatically because of gravity, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's the same all over the, again for each of the games. And this is where Phaser.io comes in. Phaser is a library or engine or framework, whatever you want to call it, that takes away all this kind of boilerplate work and gives you or leaves you with actually experimenting with the um, mechanics and how the game works and like different assets uh, real quick. So it provides a lot of, of these components that you would have to build yourself for every single game that you're building so that you have them out of the box, which is nice. But they also, if you have never built a game before, what's really great about uh, Phaser is that they have a ton of examples. So pretty much for every kind of game mechanic, they have an example ready um, for every kind of issue that you might have, like, oh, I want to display text using a Google web font that has uh, a, a gradient over it because it looks nicer for the menu. They probably, uh, they actually, I know this one, they have an example for that, for instance. So you can basically just refer back to their documentation. Mm. They're also moving really fast. Um, new releases coming out relatively quickly, not breaking too much, and the community is lovely. So if you want to build, build a game, they are there to help. So let's have a quick look. I'm having far less time than I expected to have, but um, so this is more or less how you start from zero. I hope that it's more or less readable. If it's not, then I, should I ramp up the size? Yes. Thought so, because you know, I already have not much time, so let's, let's reduce some time for making it. Better? <laughs> like half of the people have said like, oh my God, it's now silent. Just come to the front if you want, or just, you know, check it out in their documentation. So, oh, all right, the, the window is also not, that's terrific, better. So you have a bunch of callbacks, preload, create, update. We've seen this before, haven't we? And then there's like functions that we can fill in with functionality. And uh, I'm not gonna do live coding because I have like two minutes or something, so I'm just gonna fill you in quickly. Magic happened. So you see, <laughs> yeah, it's that easy. Um, so, <laughs> so what we do is, in, in preload, as I said, we're basically loading a bunch of images, uh, which can also be sprites, which basically is an image that has multiple frames of an animation in it, like, uh, like this, and then just stripped out. Um, we then says, say, we, hey, we want an arcade game physics, so we say, please initiate that system. We load the sky, which is the background, as the first thing, and um, then we create a group of, of, uh, of platforms. We make them not moving. Uh, we set the gravity, all that kind of stuff. We create the player. We set up everything like this. And then here we have the input. So we say, input, keyboard, create cursor keys, because you don't want to reinvent that. Right? Everyone's used to using cursor keys or WASD. And then here we have a collect star, so we can collect stars probably. Huh? And then here we make collision detection happen and all that kind of stuff. And long story short, 
This is what we are getting, hopefully, unless the browser goes ha ha ha. So here we have this wonderful little fella, and we can go and it has no point. But you know, I can jump, I can collect stars, and if I open the console, the console will probably tell me, um, where is the console? It's super weird with different resolutions. Collected, star collected happened, so I have, have collected a star, everything is great. And with that, you should definitely check it out. There's a workshop tomorrow. If you have like booked your ticket for the workshop, then wow, this is going to be awesome. So in summary, long story short, definitely make games because it's hilariously fun. It's a lot of different topics as well. So you learn a lot about your programming languages and your tool as well because you have to deal with all these different things, right, that you mostly not have to deal with. Um, it's a neat environment to do it in the browser because you can really quickly iterate and experiment, so that's lovely. And if you don't want to build your own game engine and Trust me, you don't want that. I have been there. It's a terrible idea. It's a fun idea as well, but you know, it's a fun in a very boring, tedious way. Um, so yeah, start experimenting. Thank you very much. Enjoy the day.